Um, the reason why some of us just keep going, right? <laughs> Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is the house of prayer, 24-7 house of prayer. Um, if anyone's watching online, this is the 24-7 house of prayer where the fire on the altar does not go out day and night. Amen? Amen. It's, a, it's a fire on the altar that does not go out. And we make it a very important point to keep the fire of worship and prayer burning. Um, and so let me just ask you guys a question. You guys love to worship? Amen? You guys really love to worship? Sometimes I feel like if there's one thing I had to choose that I could do all day and all night, if there's one thing that I really deep in my spirit I had to choose, you know, a lot of us wouldn't say this, but if I really think about it, it's worship. If I could choose one thing to do for the rest of my life, it's worship. Amen? And that's what we get to do in heaven. Amen? It's not going out there and taking a walk. It's not going and and playing some video games or getting the best food. It's worshiping God and being in his presence. That's what we get to do 24-7, 365, however you measure time in, in heaven, if there is time, <laughs> right? Um, worship. Beloved, Jesus is coming, amen? There's a day when Jesus is coming, and we will have a chance to worship all day, all night, forever, for eternity. But before that, we have a chance to worship him for 72 hours at this thing called Davis Tent, right? We haven't uh, made an announcement yet, but every year, every year, we have this worship and prayer conference called David's Tent here in Korea. There's one, I think, in Europe, in England or London, and there's one, I think, in the States. Um, but we have a, one in Korea where it's 72 hours of nonstop, continuous worship and prayer. Some of us have been there uh, last year, some of us the year before, um, some of us never, right? But we're going to have it this year once again in August. The dates are going to come out soon, so when that comes out, we'll make the announcement. But please make sure to be there for worship and prayer, amen? Nonstop, continuous worship and prayer. We get a little taste of heaven every Sunday, every day, but really set apart time, 72 hours for worship and prayer. All right. One of the reasons why, like I said, some people would just keep going and going and they can keep doing that without getting fatigued, without getting tired, is this reason. Repeat this after me. Calling. One more time. Calling. The reason why some of these guys here at K-Hop, Korean House of Prayer, the Levites, they're here worshiping every day, like literally every day. All they do is worship. But it's not that they don't get tired, right? I mean, they're people. They get tired. You know, you spend all day doing stuff. The next day, what do you want to do? You want to sit back and rest and get some sleep, right? Yet they get up again. Yet they make it to this place, this sanctuary by a certain time. For whatever reason, they're here every day keeping watch of their position and worshiping and praying to the Lord. Why is it that they do that? Let's say it one more time. Calling. One more time. Let's say it together. Calling. It's because of calling. Amen. If you have no calling in your life, you will burn yourself out. If there is no calling on your life and you have some motivation for what you do other than a calling that comes from God, other than a fire that comes from God, we will fatigue ourselves, we will get tired, get weary, and burn out, right? But if God calls us to do something, and our life's motivation is grounded and rooted in the calling of God in our lives, even if we are tired, we will never burn out. Amen? Today's message title, and I'm looking at the time, is 4.30. I'm getting a lot of messages recently online. They're like, hey, I see you're trying to keep time, right? But don't worry about time. Don't worry about time. But I can't not worry about time because I see you guys' faces, right? You guys' faces is telling me it's 4.30 right now, right? Yeah, I know it's 4.30. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm, going to tr I'm just going to, especially the intro, I'm just going to skip through everything and just get the points there, right, and then just move on. Uh, let's just read the, the passage. Today's message title is called Survival Versus Calling. Survival versus calling. And the passage is John 4, 31, verses 31 to 34. Let's read this together. Uh, let's just read it all together on the count of three. One, two, three. 
Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, can we get the next verse? 31 to 34. John chapter 4, verses 31 to 34. There you go. All right, let's read that from the top one more time. 31 to 34. On the count of three, one, two, three. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Amen. Uh, last week, I shared a message on crying out to the Lord. Right? It was a message about crying out to the Lord. Literally lifting up our voices and shouting out with this uh, desperate cry of our hearts. It's not about volume. right? I'm not talking about any kind of volume. But this desperate cry that comes out and manifests itself as a, as a sound. Uh, we are to cry out to the Lord. That's why David says, he says, awake my soul. He literally proclaims to his own soul. He says, awake my soul. Now, one of the reasons why we said we cry out to the Lord, well, number one is because, you guys remember? Number one is because, right, the Bible commands it. Amen? The Bible commands it. The Bible says, cry out to me. Cry out to me. Call upon my name. But one of the reasons why we cry out to the Lord is because it's spiritual warfare. It's a, it's a weapon of warfare for every believer to cry out to the Lord. Because if you do not cry out to the Lord, if you do not pray to the Lord, what ends up happening is our spirits turn, they fall asleep, right? Our spirits tend to fall asleep if we're not crying out to the Lord. And I shared my example of me driving back home after uh, the seven-hour prayer conference. Didn't get any sleep. And so I had to literally cry out, ah, like, Chio, Lord, for like an hour while I was driving to stay awake. Because if I didn't, I would have fell asleep. If I fell asleep, I would have ran into some curb and died, probably, right? So he says, awake my soul. And this is very important for our generation. Because today, we live in a generation that is fast asleep. We live in a generation that is asleep. And I'm not talking about literally sleeping, although there's a lot of people who are, who are out there just in, at their home sleeping a lot. But I'm talking about spiritually asleep. You ever notice every time you have a conversation with somebody, you ask, hey, how you doing? Right? Or how's your week been? And like 80% of the time, they're like, oh, you know, it's been mine. I'm tired, a little tired. You guys hear that a lot? People saying they're tired a lot fatigued, people looking burnt out, people not having much motivation, right? It's not often that you find someone with like some kind of fire in them that really starts to contaminate you and you go, oh, and it just like livens you. You don't see that too often. Am I, am I right? At least in my, I mean, in my circle, yes, I see a lot of those people, right? But if you go out into the streets, if you go out into just, you know, workplaces, you see a lot of people most, most of the time, they're just fatigued, they're tired, they're just trying to get by. Just trying to make it, right? And you see even in this nation of Korea, and not even just nation of Korea, in the States, all over the world right now, depression rates, especially in this nation, super high. Suicidal rates, highest of any nation right here in Korea, right? Why is it that the next generation, especially the next generation of younger men and women, are so asleep spiritually are so oppressed are so tired and fatigued and burnt out why is that the case people have no fire and a lot of the times they don't even have a desire to live they don't really have a desire to live right it's just the same thing over and over again every day just same thing cycle after cycle after cycle no real desire no burning fire in them and why is that it's because they have no hope they have no hope. But if you look around the world today, you can't blame them, right? You look around and see what's happening around in the world today. You cannot blame the next generation for not having hope because there's not a lot of hope to get from the world. When you start looking at things and seeing the visible world and the situations around you, there is no hope, absolutely no hope. So you cannot blame them. 
for not having hope in what they see. And for many reasons, this generation, again, is falling asleep spiritually. This generation needs to cry out to the Lord. Amen? They need to be awakened. And if they're not crying out to the Lord, we need to cry out for them. On behalf of them, we call that standing in the gap. Amen? Crying out for this next generation. And why do we need to do this? Because it's uncomfortable. Why does the next generation need to cry out? Because it's uncomfortable to cry out. It takes discipline to cry out. It takes faith to cry out. It's not just a visible matter anymore. It's a spiritual practice. It's a spiritual matter to cry out to the Lord. It's battle spiritually to cry out to the Lord. Why do we do this? Because the enemy is wanting the exact opposite. We want to cry out to the Lord. What does the enemy want to do? He wants to silence you. He wants to silence you. He wants to make sure nothing comes out of your mouth. And that's exactly why we're going to cry out to the Lord. Amen? We got to keep crying out. Why? Enemy wants to silence us. He wants to sever our relationship to the Lord who is our only source of hope, our only source of joy, our only source of life, and our only satisfaction in life. If we have this relationship severed, we have nothing. We have no reason to live. We are like everybody else who does not know the Lord. Maintain the relationship with the Lord by crying out to the Lord. Amen? We live in this overly, intensely saturated society and culture. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, and I know you are, but it's highly sensual and stimulating. So many outlets for information and technology and comfort and media and entertainment and drug use and alcohol and so many things that we have laid out in front of us in our lives now, right? So many choices, so many voices, so many sights, so much, right? Overly saturated. But you know what this becomes? If you have no hope or a satisfaction in your maker, it becomes an addiction. So many things that pull you and you're trying to look for something to satisfy your soul, but you don't have something to satisfy your soul. Or maybe you have something to satisfy your soul, but you let go of that satisfaction. Even though you know the true satisfaction is in the Lord, you keep leaning towards these things. And that's called the sinful nature that's in us, right? And so these things pull at us and we give in. We give in and submit to those things and those things become addictions over time. So what do we have in this generation? We have a highly saturated, oversaturated generation, which leads to a highly addicted generation. Highly addicted group of young men and women. And when you consume the wrong things, because you know addiction is very powerful, but when you consume the wrong things, addictions will consume you and kill you. Consume the right things, and that addiction can consume you and give you life. But the only addiction that can consume you and give you life are the things of God. Amen? But if it's not the things of God, it will consume you and kill you. You know, scientists call addiction a uh, brain disease. It's literally a brain disease, right? And you guys know how all the whole dopamine thing, dopamine thing works, right? Dopamine? Dopamine. You get a, a jolt of pleasure from doing something, and your brain is satisfied with that behavior. For example, you eat some food. It likes it. Okay, so you repeat that action. But the problem is, when you start doing that with things you shouldn't be doing, right, with negative things, with, with bad things, substances like drugs or alcohol or whatever, what, what happens is it releases way too much dopamine into your brain. I heard it was like, it was like 10 times more. Like a, it's like a flood of dopamine. Isn't that funny that they call it a flood of dopamine, right? It's the flood that comes into your brain. And once that flood comes, basically what happens is it's, so, it's such a shock to you, right? And you keep craving more of it, but at the same time, you get desensitized to it. So you want more, but you feel it less. And so you try to get more, but it doesn't satisfy you. You try to get more, it doesn't satisfy you. And just keep, keep, keep going until, like, it's just a cycle that never, ever ends. That's called an addiction, right? That's how that cycle begins. But whether we like it or not, the problem is this. Many of us, even our so-called Christians, are in this flood of addiction, many of us, in this flood, this warm water, you know that uh, 
that analogy that I, I like to use a lot, but it's such a relevant analogy, the, the frog in the boiling pot, it's such a relevant analogy for this age because many of us are in the warm water, the lukewarm water, just feeling it, just chilling, right? Oh, that feels good. Oh, that's nice. YouTube for five hours. All right. That's good, right? We're just chilling. And we love it. And we're in the warm water. And then we're like, yeah, that feels. And we're dead, right? That's what's happening to us. Highly addicted. The temperature is slowly is rising. And some of us don't even know something is wrong. Because we've just been used to it. This is how we grew up, right? Which life as usual. What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. But as we've said many times before, beloved, there is a trend to the way the world moves. Everything around you in this present age, the Bible speaks of as an evil present age. Therefore, the way that the world is moving, if you just follow along with it, no matter how dandy and you know, nice it looks, it's the road to destruction. We need to wake up, lift the scales and the veils from our eyes and see what's happening so that we can jump out of the warm water into life. Amen? I pray that that spirit of wisdom and revelation would fall on us today. Amen? We can't fall into the trap. we got to be awake and alert. That's what the sons of Issachar are, being awake, discerning what the spiritual situation of the times is, and leading Israel to do what they ought to do. But to lead someone, you need a direction. To lead someone, you cannot be just here, 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 this and that, do this, this. No, there's a direction, and you need to lead people saying, this is the way, right? Psalm 119.9, I just want to proclaim this. For us Christians, like I said, there is something that's stronger than any worldly addiction. The world doesn't know what to do with themselves. They're just trying to look for something to satisfy them, right? And so they get involved in substance abuse. They get involved in drugs. Even Korea, drug is, drugs is going rampant right now in Korea in the next generation. Who would have thought, right? But it's here, right? Your kids aren't safe because they're in Korea. Your kids are safe because the Lord has them covered, amen? Even in Korea, it's the same thing now, right? It's ran, running rampant. But for us believers, we have one thing that can break Every addiction in our lives. Break every chain. What is that? Psalm 199. Let's proclaim this together. On a count of three. One, two, three. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. Amen. The word of God breaks every addiction. It guards against any addiction. The word of God is what keeps our hearts pure. Amen. The word of God. Now, in this boiling water, there is a warning and an encouragement, not the boiling water, sorry. Even in the boiling water, right, we call it the flood. I call it the flood of dopamine. We could also call it like the flood of shark-infested waters might have you, right, if that's how we want to express it. We have something that protects us from that flood. We just said that was the word of God. It is the ark of salvation. Just as in the days of Noah, right, as we get into the end times, it says, as in the days of Noah, just as in the, in the days of Noah, when the flood comes, we have an ark of salvation, and that is going to be the word of God. In this day and age, those who hold fast to the word of God will be protected from this flood that is coming. And those who are fighting and going against the tide, against the ways of the world in this age, this passage right here that we read as the main passage is going to serve as both a warning and an encouragement to us today. Now, there's actually a study uh, that, tells, that tells us, tells you, right? There's a study that says this. Most people's addictions are not actually rooted in anything related to that addiction. Like, for example, if you have a sexual addiction, a lot of the times, although past trauma is a factor as well, that's a factor as well. But apart from that, it's not all, be it's not all related to that past trauma, Right? If you have a sexual addiction, it's not always related to a sexual matter. If you have a substance addiction, it's not always related to a substance use in the past. Not always. There's a study that shows a root cause of addictions. And you'll be surprised that to a certain extent, many people struggle with addiction because of a lack of purpose. 
People, tr- they, they develop and struggle with addiction because they lack purpose in their lives. Why? If someone has a strong sense of purpose, they will overcome any challenge that comes, through the, that comes their way. You throw something at somebody that has a purpose, and this could be something that's, I'm not even talking about of God, right? You have some kind of motivation, like some kind of goal in your life, right? I'm going to reach that body this year, right? I'm going to make that body for the first time in my life. For once in my life, I'm going to hit the gym more than twice a week, right? I'm going to get in there. And you just have that, uh, that goal in your mind. People who really set their minds, some people, no matter what they say, friends say, hey, let's go out to eat. Hey, let's go get a, get a drink. Hey, let's do this. Th-. No, I can't. I can't. I got to hit the gym. I got to eat chicken breast. I got to do this, right? They do that, right? And they just fling off all those distractions, and they just overcome the challenges, right? But this is even right spiritually. People with a purpose, or for better words, people with a calling, they will overcome everything. Any spiritual challenge or distraction that comes their way, that could be laziness, that could be temptation, that could be anything that comes their way, they will overcome it. Matter of fact, even if they fall, even if they experience a setback, those who have a a clear and a sure calling, they will get right back up and keep going. Isn't that amazing? Everyone will fall at some point. But only those with a clear purpose and a calling will continue to bounce back and go forward. Those who don't have a purpose, they have no reason to get up in the morning. They have no reason to overcome the challenge. There's no reason to overcome it. There's no reward from overcoming that challenge. If they fall, it's better to stay down because it's harder to get back up. Right? And you just succumb to the pains of life and of past scars and of past trauma. Beloved, we have to ask ourselves the question today. Do you have a purpose in your life? Do you have a clear vision, a clear purpose? Are you walking with the calling of God on your life? This is absolutely important. And where does your strength to press on come from? Genesis 28, 15, one of my favorite verses. Let's read this, or I'll just read it. It says, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Amen? This is God talking to Jacob, and he's telling him clear as day, I'm not leaving you until the promise that I've given you is fulfilled. That means if I've given you a calling, I'm right there in that place of calling. Wherever you go, as long as you're in alignment with my calling in your life, I'm right there with you. And if I'm right there with you, who can be against you? Amen? God is in the place of calling. Let's say that together. God is in the place of calling. Amen? Meaning a life with no calling is no life at all. Because a life without a calling means God is not there. If God is not there, there's no hope. There's no reason to live. No wonder this generation is hopeless. Beloved, we're in April now. Can you believe that? It's April already. I thought it was yesterday when I was was up here saying, hey, let's, let's break through in prayer this year. 2024, right? Quantity and quality of prayer, right? That first sermon on like January 1st, that was like yesterday. It's April now. And I can't help but look back. How have I been living out this year so far? I just started to assess. Because I had a few days to myself this week, right? So I was just thinking, man, how have I been living out this year so far? Have I been living this year out successfully in the Lord, successfully? Or have I made some turns, had some setbacks in this year? And it's already April, but we still got... Eight months left. I mean, it's, it's a long, we're a long way in, but we still have eight months left. How am I going to continue to press on in this year and break through in this year? Because let's be honest, some of us, it's April, and we're feeling burnt out already. Some of us, it's April, we're like, when's 2025 coming, right? Some of us are enjoying 2024. It's going good, right? 
The low maybe has not come yet. But whatever situation you're in, beloved, we need to understand that if we are to press forth in this year or in any year, we must continue to hold on to the calling God has placed on our lives. Amen? Days get tiring. Weeks get tiring. All of us get tired, physically fatigued. We have work, right? Work consumes our life. All of these things are real factors in our lives that we cannot ignore. But why is it that even after a weekend of rest, some of us don't get weekends rest, but a lot of us do. We get weekend rest, and on Monday, we go back to work, but we're more tired on Monday than on Friday. You, sometimes you get that. Like, waking up on Monday is harder than waking up on Friday. Is that not right? I mean, for me, my rest day is Thursday. So if you apply this to me, waking up on Friday is harder than waking up on Wednesday. You know what I mean? Why is that the case? Why is it that we get the physical rest? We get the physical food. We do all the things that we need to do to take care of ourselves. But still, there's some kind of fatigue and tiredness, spiritual sleepiness in our lives that lingers in our lives. Beloved, we're not tired because we do a lot. We're not tired because we have a, a busy schedule. I know people with busy schedules. They got schedule after schedule after schedule. They get pretty much no rest. Ten minutes of sleep here and there, like every day. Fifteen minutes of sleep here and there, just like in, their, in the office. Just, okay, let me get my fifteen. All right, back to. And these people are the most physically tired but the most spiritually alive people I know. Beloved, we're not tired because we don't get physical rest. And I'm not saying physical rest is not important. Don't get me wrong. Physical rest is very important. But we're not tired because we are busy. We're tired because we eat the wrong food. We're not eating the right food to fuel our strength. That's why we're tired. Amen? You can rest all weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But if you do not eat, Eat of the food that will give you life. On Monday, you will be more tired than you are on Friday. You can go on a vacation and like everyone in the world says, oh, I can't wait to go and, and take this trip. Oh, I can't wait to go and get away and escape. Escape. This word escape is such a strategic move from the enemy. Escape. Escape what? Escape life? Escape life. To go somewhere better than what you have in front of you, right? Escape. And we think that once we do that and come back, we'll be more refreshed and recharged, right? But that is a lie of the enemy. Escape is the wrong word there. Rest, cool. Rest, yes. Escape, no. We eat the wrong food. Our passage gives us some insight. So here Jesus has just finished talking with the Samaritan woman at the well. We all know the story of the Samaritan woman. Right? He just finished talking with the Samaritan woman and says, hey, bring your husband. No, not that guy. No, you don't have a husband. Like there's like Jedi mind tricks. <laughs> husband, no husband. Yeah, husband. Oh, no. Okay, right? Just all this stuff. And she gets super blessed, obviously. And she's going around telling everybody about Jesus. Disciples come back. They've got out to get some food. They got out to the towns to get some food. They're back. They're like, they see this Samaritan woman talking with Jesus or Jesus talking with a Samaritan woman. They're like, okay. Because <laughs> that's unheard of in, in that time. But they don't say nothing. They just say, okay. And they tell him to eat. He's like, Rabbi, eat. And he's like, I have food that you don't know about. And they're like, okay. <laughs> what is this guy talking about, right? What food? And they literally maybe probably thought that he literally had like some hidden food. Like he had a pizza in his back pocket or something. If they had back pockets back in the day. What do, you, what do you mean? Rabbi, somebody bring this guy something to eat. That's what's happening here. <laughs> and they must have thought he was going mad or something because he was hungry. But Jesus was not talking about physical food, right? Jesus was talking about spiritual food. And again, we cannot get it twisted here. Jesus is not neglecting the importance of physical food. He's a man. He ate. He slept. Matter of fact, kudos to the disciples because the disciples did a good thing. They were not doing something like bad or stupid. They're trying to meet the needs of their maker. 
Here, eat some food. That's not a bad attitude and a posture. But it's just that they did not know that there is a food that is more important than physical food. That's why he says there is a food that you don't know about. He doesn't rebuke them saying, hey, how could you give me physical food? I want spiritual food, right? He's not rebuking them. He just says there is food that you don't know about. The spiritual over the physical. Beloved, there is a spiritual reality that is more real than the physical reality. Amen? To us believers, we are spiritual beings. We often forget this because we have a flesh and we, of course, we are in the world. So we cannot ignore it, but we are of the kingdom of God. In the world of heaven. And therefore, that's why we, you know, even during COVID, we always used to say, hey, we follow all the laws. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. We'll take that, right? We want to be good civilians on this earth. However, we are good civilians as long as Caesar's law does not contradict with the kingdom's law. As soon as Caesar's law contradicts with the kingdom law, you know what happens? This law is superior. This law is transcendent. We are of the kingdom of heaven. Amen? That's why people will put their lives on the line to keep the law of God over the law of Caesar. And we call that martyrdom. The physical and the spiritual. How am I going to get through all this? Okay. <laughs> okay, please pray for me. Let's say this together. Survival versus calling. Beloved, if you look at this passage, there's a really important important point that Jesus makes here and that is this there is a clear divide between the physical and the spiritual for Jesus clear divide here rabbi eat no I have food what food this food what food right clear divide between the physical and the spirit meaning this the disciples have their eyes set on the things of this earth while Jesus has his eyes set on the things above. This is the difference between the disciples and Jesus. If you want to separate physical and spiritual, you could also say it like this. Physical, spiritual. Things of this earth, things above. Another way to say it is this. Flesh and spirit. Another way to say it is survival and calling. Amen? The reason why Many of us, again, like I said earlier, succumb to worldliness and ungodliness and get caught up in addictions and chains and waste away our lives. It's because we lack a calling. It's because we live our lives not according to the spirit, but according to the flesh. Not We don't set our eyes on the things above, but our eyes are set on, are set on the things of this earth. We are only tuning into the physical and the visible, not the spiritual and the invisible. Our work, Jesus Christ says here, he says, my work, my food is to do the will of, will of God and accomplish his work. So his food is meant for work, right? That's his work. However, our food and our work is not the right food and not the right work. So that's why we choose P over S, is which, which is what I put here, which means physical and spiritual. We choose physical over spiritual. We choose the fleshly things over the spirit, over the, the, the spirit, the things of the spirit. Why? Because we have the wrong food and the wrong work. What do I mean by that? Most of us here work 40 hours a week, maybe 50, I don't know depending on where you work. Most of us either work or are students. We study, that's your work, right? Some of us are in ministry, that's your work. Anyways, we have work that we do, right? We have work. But the question that we have to ask ourselves as Christians is this. What is really our work? Why do we work and what is the ultimate goal of our work? Another easy way to ask this question is this. Do we work and do all that stuff to eat or do we eat to work? Let me ask that question again because you might, what is this guy saying? Do we work to eat or do we eat to work? 
Which one is it? Is it A or B? You guys hate it when options are thrown at you because you don't want to be scorned, right? The disciples represent many of us who often find ourselves working hard, doing life, working 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, doing all these things just to eat, just to focus on the physical things, just to linger and stay in the things of this earth. And in other words, we do all of that just to survive. Just to eat, just to earn some money, just to have a nice house, just to get a car, just to find a nice wife or a husband, just to do something that is of this earth. I'm not saying any of those things are bad. Obviously, those things are, are good, but their goal is survival on this earth. And this is what the disciples are representing. This is, in extreme cases, very bad. I don't know if you guys know things like a foodie culture or mukbang. You guys know what mukbang is, right? What is mukbang in English? Uh, eat food, e eat room, eating room, <laughs> eat room, ER. Yeah, that's how you go to the ER. Eating room, mukbang, where people they live stream and they're literally their work is to eat. They're like just like eating ten ramyuns or something like that, right? Ten. What is ten ramyuns? Like literally getting like twenty tonkasses, and this little tiny girl eats all of that and puts it all in her stomach. Somehow I don't know how she does it, right? But to me, it kind of discomforts my spirit seeing that just a little bit because it's so representative of a gluttonous age of people that find entertainment and just like stuffing their face with fleshly desires and pleasures. That's the goal right there. That's it. And people are like, oh, I can't eat that much, so eat it for me, right? And they find like satisfaction out of somebody else. In Korean, that's called teri manjo, right? You're finding satisfaction through somebody else. Like, yes, eat it for me, right? Food culture, same thing. Their whole purpose of life is to go here and eat this food. Go here and eat this food. Go to Italy, get some gelato. Go to New York, get some halal guys, right? So many things. All this work just for mere physical goals and survival. And it's representative of this sensual age. But let me tell you, Jesus did not work to eat he ate spiritual food. He didn't even eat the physical. He ate spiritual food to work. Amen? Jesus' life was not about survival. Jesus' life was all about his calling. That was it. So much to the point that he would forego physical food, uh, physical pleasures, physical comfort. He would fast. He would lose sleep to pray. Whatever he had to do. To accomplish the work of God, he did it. He never let the physical control him. He's not negating, negating or neglecting the physical, but he never let the physical control him. What was his mission? What was the thing that was always on his heart? It was one thing. It was to seek first the kingdom of God. It was to give glory to God and therefore to seek and save the lost. That was his mission. When he first came to this earth, he seeked Sought and saved the lost, and to do that, he died on the cross, he resurrected, and now he's in the heavens. That was his first mission. Beloved, if you have no purpose, you have no direction. If you have no direction, you're scattered and wandering. If you're scattered and wandering, you're lost. And if you're lost, you're living by your flesh. There's no doubt about it. No direction, no purpose in your life leads to a life of living according to your flesh, living just comfortably with no leadership from the Spirit. But God commands us something. Galatians 5, 16 and 17, he says this. God commands us to walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh. Amen? He says this, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of of the flesh for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do there are things we want to do sometimes i look at the mukbang and i'm like i want to try that but i know i can't and it hurts my pride a little bit because this little girl 
eats like 30 times more than I do. Seriously. It's amazing. It's like a, it's like a, what do you call it? Like a, the sev- one of the seven wonders of the world. Seriously. It's, it's insane. There's things that we want to do. But beloved, one thing we have to understand, and this is why we need the gospel preached to us every day. Ourselves every day. What we want to do is sinful. Our carnal and fleshly desires that come up, even after we're saved, they come up because we're still in the flesh. Those desires, unless they've been transformed by the Spirit of God, they are still sinful. Therefore, when the fleshly desires come up, we have to cut them off and kill the deeds of the flesh every day by being led by the Spirit. Amen? There's nothing good in our sinful nature. Our, uh, our church has a school called the Cross Church School. And I work in this place called the Cross Church School on the, on the sixth floor. Right? I'm, I'm a teacher. So we do this thing called SOT. It's a homeschooling program called School of Tomorrow. And one of the cool things about this program is that the kids basically work by themselves. They do everything by themselves. The teachers don't teach like a normal classroom. They're sitting in their own office. They work by themselves. Teachers just check their work and just lead them and guide them. And one of the cool things is that they even check their own work. Like, for example, uh, they do a page, and then they have to take the page and go to this place called the scoring station. And at the scoring station, the answer key is there. They take out the answer key. They compare their answers to the answer key, and they have to mark themselves if they're right or wrong. Now, imagine what would happen if you give little kids the authority to mark and check whether they're right or wrong. What do you think will happen? Kids are, kids are sinners, right? You would want them to just exercise perfect self-control and have honesty and integrity, right? And just go, oh, that's wrong. Well, there you go. And then go back to the seat. No way. Almost every single day, for some reason, there's like a page full of mistakes that have not been marked. And I asked them, what's going on, right? Why didn't you mark it? This is a violation. You should have marked it. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. Oh, I... They're lying. They're lying. They chose to ignore it and bring it back and try to fix it. That's what they try to do. Or they fix it on the spot. At the school. Oh, this is wrong, right? Just real quick. That's what they do, right? But why do we do this? Why do we allow them? Because God, God's character is the same. He doesn't control us. Amen? He doesn't force us to do right and prevent us from doing wrong every single time. He gives every one of us the free will to choose right and wrong. Amen? This is what he did to Adam and Eve. They had the choice to choose from the knowledge, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The choice of right and wrong, and we teach God's character to these children so that they can practice in the safe space that we've created for them. Practice honesty. Practice the fear of the Lord. Practice integrity. And develop God's character as they, you know, go through school life. So that when they get to the world, they'll be ready to face even bigger temptations. Why? Because if they can't face the temptation of just getting one answer wrong that has nothing to do with anything else, like it doesn't even affect them, right? If they can't overcome that t- temptation, how are they going to overcome the temptations of the world that are much greater and much scarier in a sense, right? Or scarier is not the right word. Much more desirable than just a right answer. If we cannot do it now, we cannot do it later. If we're not walking by the Spirit now, we cannot walk by the Spirit later. Amen? This is very important for us. Because we are nothing but animals if we live our lives just according to our flesh. There's no difference between us and animals if we live our lives according to our desires. Our desires are, are, are naturally sinful, right? Their natural inclination is to market Correct, even though it's wrong, because that's their natural inclination as sinners, right? They don't want to be wrong. They want to lie. They want to get away from that, right? Same thing with us. If we just live according to our flesh, we're no different than animals. Animals have no spirits. We have a spirit. We're spiritual beings, but animals have no spirits, right? But you know what the problem with this world is? 
is that our generation, we've got to a point where we treat animals like spiritual beings. And we treat humans like non-spiritual beings. Meaning we treat animals like humans and humans like dogs. Dogs like humans, humans like dogs. There might be some dog lovers in here that might throw stones at me. So I'm just going to back off real quick. I like dogs. I love dogs. They're really cute. I really like them. But we're not the same as dogs and cats. We're spiritual beings, right? But we put clothes on dogs, yet we don't clothe the naked and poor. We're helping dogs get bats and do all this treatment and stuff, but we're neglecting people on the street. We've gotten to a point where we got it mixed up like humans or dogs and dogs are humans. And some people at this point are even marrying dogs now. Did you know that? There's people who are marrying dogs. Beloved, we are no different if we cannot make a distinction between us and animals. The distinction between us and animals and all of the creation is that we have a spiritual, we have a spiritual side to us. We are spiritual beings. We can be led by the Spirit. Amen? We can work in partnership with God because we are spiritual beings just as He is a spirit. We are the only ones on this earth that have that privilege. No other creation has that privilege. So one of the most foolish things you can say as a Christian, this is one of the most foolish things you can say, is I do what I want. I said that so many times as a kid to my mom. Clean your room. I do what I want, right? Go do this. I do what I want. It is the most immature and foolish thing we can say as a Christian. Christians do not do what they want. Amen? Christians are dead to the world and are dead to their flesh. And we're alive in Christ. So we do not do what we want. Galatians 5.24 says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Galatians 2.20, I didn't give it to you, but famous, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, right? I have been crucified with Christ. Every time people did what they wanted, especially in Scripture, Everything went wrong. Every time people did what was right in their own eyes, tragedy happens. This is the pattern of the scriptures. And so allowing your flesh to control you, allowing what your desires are of the carnal desires to control you. When you get angry, being just letting out rage. When you're hungry, just eating. When you want to sleep, just sleep. Right? This lifestyle is no different than that of animals. Driven by the flesh. Beloved, let's repeat this after me. Don't be driven by the flesh. Be driven by the spirit. One more, one more time. Be driven by the spirit. That's why the Bible says, do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. We don't succumb to the desires of the flesh. We don't succumb to situation or our sinful natures. We as Christians only submit to the will of God. This is our lifestyle. And a fruit of walking by the Spirit is self-control, right? Self-control is being able to not do what you want to do. As the scripture said earlier, there's things that we want to do. But when we walk by the Spirit, what happens? It suppresses that desire. It kills that desire so that we end up not doing what our sinful nature wants to do. But we submit to what God wants us to do. Proverbs tells us, uh, I forget exactly which scripture, I didn't give it to you. But Proverbs tells us that a man without self-control is like a city with broken walls, right? A city broken into left without walls. In other words, if there is no self-control by walking with the spirit and you live how you want to live your life, that means you have no boundaries, no standards, no discipline. And what happens? The enemy just plays with you as Easy as taking candy from a baby. He plays with you. And situations, when the wind blows, there's no boundaries to protect you. You go this way. When the waves hit this way, you go this way. And it's like the shaft that the wind just blows away. It's talking about, that, that they talk about in Psalm 1. 
The difference between someone who doesn't have self-control and someone who has it, someone who walks with the Spirit and someone who doesn't walk with the Spirit, someone who is focusing on the physical and someone who's focusing on the spiritual is this. Again, it is this issue of purpose. One lives to survive, the other lives with a calling. Our end goal is not here. Our end goal is not the physical world and just the things of this earth. Our goal is the kingdom of God. Amen? Let's say that together. Our goal is the kingdom of God. Amen? The Bible says the kingdom is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not a matter of eating and drinking, but of joy, peace, and righteousness. Those with the calling have a reason to overcome temptation. Those with the calling have a reason to get up in the morning. Those with the calling have a reason to fight and battle with their sin. There's a reason to get back up after a failure. In the worst of situations, when there's no reason to be thankful, there's a reason to be thankful and keep going in the worst of situation. And there's a reason to make wise, self-disciplined use of your time. Beloved, one of the most precious things we have in this life is time. You believe this? Time is so important. We often ignore time, but we are rich with time, but also not rich with time. Time is what we have the most of, but it's also running out, right? Time, how we use our time, is so important in our mission and in our calling. That's why David says, Give me wisdom, right? So uh, Help me to count the number of my days so that I may walk in wisdom. He wants to walk in wisdom with the amount of time that he has left. He doesn't want to waste any time on helpless and worthless matters, matters on idols. He wants to use all his time and gear all his time wisely towards the kingdom of God. This is the heart of David. Jesus came with the mission a calling, and he fulfilled it. And his purpose in life was to do the work of God and to accomplish that work. Do we have that kind of work in our lives? Do we work in our lives solely just to submit to his will and to accomplish his work? Is that our end goal, our one goal? Do we have that kind of work? Beloved, I'm not talking about employment. Work is not employment. When I say work, I'm not talking about the job that we have, right? We need a new perspective of work. I promise I'll just clear up the perspective of work and I'll finish. Genesis 2.15. Beloved, we have a wrong view of work. Genesis 2.15 is Jesus, or not Jesus, God, uh, he makes Adam. He places him in the garden. And the first thing he does when he places Adam in the garden is he gives him an assignment. He gives him work. It says here, the Lord God, actually let's read this together on the count of three. One, two, three. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Amen? The word work here is not job. It's not employment. It didn't say God employed him, right? Like God is the first employer. He's the major, you know, there's like the big four. He's the big one, you know. The word work here is avoda in Hebrew, which means to serve and to work, uh, to worship. Work is to serve or to worship. Serve as a Levitical sacrifice, right? Worship. So work and worship are inseparable. They're the same thing. Beloved, work is not employment. Work is worship. Amen? Let's say that together. Work is worship. And worship is work. You cannot... Make this definition into something that's different. Work is not just a job, right? God gave Adam this first assignment. And this was his calling. Work was his calling here. To take care of the Garden of Eden. To keep it. To name all the animals. All of this stuff. That's his work. And this is an honorable and noble work. Why? Because he's partnering with God in his work. He's partnering with God in his work and he's giving glory to God with his work. It's an honorable thing. But we view, most of us in this society, we view work as a punishment. 
We view work as something that we got to drop blood, sweat, tears, and toil for, which is true, right? It's true. It, it does take blood, sweat, and tears. But we view work as something that we got to do. We have to do to pay our bills. We have to work to basically what? We view it as something that's dif different from life that we got to get through. Work is something that we just have to get through to get to our real life. That's what we think of it as, isn't it? Oh, so here we go again. Nine to five, all right? Go through it, go through it, go through it, go through it. Five o'clock, okay, back to my life. And then we step back into our lives. To pay our bills, to buy food. Just something that we have to get through to get to our actual lives. But there should be no divide between work and life. Because work and life are now not opposing factors. Work and life, they go together. Work is worship. Worship is work. Life is worship. Worship is life. Amen? They're not separable. You cannot oppose them together. They go together, right? Think of it like this. The economic worker, the guy who gets paid to do his job, he works as much as he gets paid. He just does the 9 to 5. After the 9 to 5, he's out of there, right? And after the 5 o'clock, he's getting back to his life. But think about the artist. If you guys know any artists around you, artists don't end their work at 5 p.m. Artists' entire lives is revolved around their work. Every, every single moment is a point of inspiration to work. But the artist, he lives not to take, but to give, right? He lives to work and to give. That's his life. The world has brainwashed us with something called a work-life balance. You guys heard of the term work-life balance before. That's a very popular term, work-life balance. Oh, this company will give you a great work-life balance. I worked in a company that gave great work-life balance, right? Make sure they... Let you go right at 5 p.m. That in Korea, in Korean, you call that knife, uh, knife exit. <laughs> knife, you get to leave, right? You get to leave right on the dot, sharp as a knife, right? Just when it hits five, boom, you're out of there. That's called kalte. That company used to do that for me, right? But this, beloved, is a strategic lie from the enemy. To break apart God's design for work. Your work is your life. Your work is not your in confined employment from 9 to, nine to 5. Work-life balance is a nice phrase for idleness. Is a nice phrase for laziness. Why do I say that? Idleness is not just sitting still. It's not just sitting still, right? Idleness, it's chasing distractions instead of godly purpose and good work. In other words, it's looking for other foods to satisfy you instead of looking for God's purpose. This is idleness. This is laziness. I'm not talking about resting. Don't, don't, don't rush ahead of me there. We get tired from work because we turn to idleness for food. And we eat the wrong food when we rest. So we get off at, nine to at 5 p.m. We go home and we start our lives. What do a lot of us do? Really, what do a lot of us do? In this day and age, there are so many things that are designed to keep you in idleness, to keep you in laziness, to keep you just comfortable in the warm water that is going to start boiling very soon. Let me give you an example. These days, we've been talking about AI, how AI has been dramatically changing, right? Everything about technology, making everything more efficient, right? That's a good thing. There's a lot of systems like ChatGPT, Sora, even Bible Chat these days. I don't know if you guys have seen Bible Chat. You can ask an AI about everything about scripture. It tells you right on the spot. It's pretty accurate too, right? It's taking away the work from doing everything and making everything efficient and saving time, which is cool. Saving time is cool, right? I love saving time. 
But the problem is this. There are now other things that come up and are invented and thrown at our faces to take us away from actual rest using that safe time or actual productive work that we could be doing in that safe time. The reason we rest, we don't need a work-life balance. We need rest. Amen? Rest means taking maybe, you know, a, a moment to rejuvenate, to recharge, to get physical sleep, food, any of that stuff. Spiritual food, obviously, right? Resting in order to do what? So that you can go right back in and start running the race again. You go right back in and start fighting the good fight again. You don't stop fighting the fight. You don't stop running the race after 5 p.m., right? If you have a purpose, your purpose is, it revolves around for your whole life. It doesn't stop at a certain time. Okay, I'm not about that purpose anymore from 5 to next morning at 8, and then starting 9, I'll start again. We don't do that, right? Our purpose is 24-7. However, in order to continue going because we're still in the flesh, we need to rest. We need to be able to recharge and get back in the race. But the problem is this. There are things that now take us away from doing work in that saved time. What are those things? Media, entertainment, fun has taken away the meaning of true rest. True rest. Spiritual food that really is supposed to recharge us and strengthen us once again to go back in and start fighting again. For example, TV and games, and social media. All of these things are what? They're things that kill time. They just kill time. They disrespect your time, guys. You never thought about it like that? Social media disrespects your time. It's like someone who's late to an appointment that you have, right? And they show up 30 minutes late. That's what social media is doing to you. Literally, because while you're waiting, you're on social media, right? Like that. It's disrespecting your time. Because in that time, what are you doing? You're involving yourself in activities that now we can just passively enjoy. Passively scrolling. Passively watching a game that we're not participating in. Passively doing all these things that require absolutely nothing on our part anymore. We're just idle, just distracted. No purpose, just there. And why is that good? Because it's comfortable. It feels good. Because we're bored. And boredom calls for entertainment, right? Boredom calls for satisfaction. So what can we look to to satisfy our boredom? This hole in my heart. Oh, a movie here and there. Again, I love movies, right? I'm not saying movies are bad. I just want to make that clear. But we look to the wrong things to recharge and rest and satisfy us. But beloved, if we keep doing that and living in comfort and just gratifying the desires of the flesh every single time, what happens? The water is going to start boiling. And you're going to get accustomed to living according to your flesh and not living according to your spirit, to the spirit, and living according to a calling. Beloved, we don't respond to fleshly desires. We don't respond to situations. We move when the Lord says to move. Amen? We do when the Lord says to do. We rest when the Lord says to rest. We do everything in response to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. This is a man, a woman who lives according to the calling that God has given. Again, these things are not bad in, in and of themselves. But there is a danger of idleness if you do not have a focus. What is your purpose? What is your focus? What is your calling for every single thing that you do in your life, even in your rest? Is your rest geared towards doing the will of God and accomplishing the work of the Father? Is your rest geared towards that or is your rest separate from your work? And now your rest is your comfort zone, your life, and this is just punishment. Is that how we view our lives? We cannot compartmentalize. Compart oh man, that's hard. Compartmentalize. Compartmentalize? Is that right? Compartmentalize. How many syllables is that? Compartmentalize. Five syllables. We cannot compartmentalize our lives, but our whole lives must be a worship unto the Lord. Amen? Let's read Romans 12, 1, 2, and we'll end it right here. Romans 12, 1, 2. 
Romans 12, 1, 2. Let's read this with a loud voice on the count of three. One, two, three. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. Beloved, our worship team, you can come back up. Beloved, the question is this. Are we eating to work or are we working to eat? Are we living just to survive, right? Are we living to eat, just survive? Or are we living with a purpose and a calling in our lives? Jesus says, my food is to do the will of God. Even his partaking of food is for the will of God. His rest is for the will of God. His going up to the mountains to pray is for the will of God. His death is for the will of God. All his life, he never compartmentalized his life. His life as a whole fell under the will of God. This is the life of Jesus, the model of Jesus. Beloved, where does your strength come from? How do you press on? And how are you going to press on for the rest of 2024? Through all the ups and downs that may come, in the face of fatigue and burnout and the winds and the waves of situations that may come blowing at your face in the months ahead. You never know what's going to happen. How will you press on if you live to just survive? If your eyes are just set on the things of this earth, you will be washed away by the waves. You will go back and forth by the wind. But if you have a calling in your life, you will break through anything that comes in your way and you will continue to press forth let's say this together seek first the kingdom of god one more time live for him and his glory and when we do that he gives us grace he gives us grace to do what i'm going to read one more verse titus 2 11 to 12 titus 2 11 to 12 i think i gave that to you oh i didn't give that to you okay i'll just read it it says for the grace of god has appeared bringing salvation for all people and this grace does what? It trains us to renounce ungodliness. Renounce it. And worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Beloved, the grace of God is available to us. And is training us every single day to renounce our worldly passions. To renounce ungodliness. To renounce satisfactions of the world that feel comfortable now but are actually leading us to death. Right? This false idea of work-life balance where we compartmentalize our lives and we worship God on Sundays from 3 to 6. But as soon as we step out from 6 p.m., we feel like we're back in life. But we're not back in life at 6. This is all our life. Worship doesn't stop at six it continues on in every single moment in a crevice all of that in our lives our lives are the work of God again not saying to ignore the physical we have a body but the flesh and soul as there is a body right there's a flesh soul and a spirit the flesh and soul must submit to the spirit and what does this mean let's say this one more time together or not one more time we never said it let's say this together present day living one more time present day living but eternity minded why don't we do that one more time present day living but eternity minded beloved I pray that from this day forth that all of us every single day of our lives would be an aroma and an incense of worship to the Lord amen Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, whether it's in our rest time, whether it's in our own private time, right? We often say, don't touch this time. This is my time, right? No, it's not your time. It's the Lord's time. Every moment of our time, I pray that would be a worship unto the Lord, no matter which form, shape, or way. Let it be a worship unto the Lord. Let's, live, uh, let's uh, rise to our feet and let's go into a time of prayer. 
We're going to just pray three things today. First thing we're going to pray is this. The world lives for one thing. It's to gratify the desires of the flesh. It says, in the end times, it will be as in the days of Noah. Which means people will be eating and drinking and giving themselves to marriage. Meaning what? Their focus is purely on the things of this earth. Just this is it. This is all of it. So because this is everything, there's no hope. There's, no, there's nothing that comes after. There's no reason to invest in the spiritual things. They can just give themselves into gratifying selfish desires and fleshly desires and sin. and That's their life. Eating and drinking. Survival. But beloved, the kingdom of God is not of eating and drinking, but of joy, peace, and righteousness. Amen? Our eyes are not focused on the things of this earth. Our eyes are focused on the things above. As the church, our sole focus, especially in this end time, is not anything of this world. But it is solely the return of our Lord Jesus. The spiritual things and the things above. We're presently living. We're living in this world. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. We work hard and we work diligently. We give everything that we have and we serve others and we, we do his kingdom work in this earth. But it's all in the context and in relation to eternity. And so, beloved, I just want to pray like this. Let's pray. Lord, let us be a church. Let us be a people that do not live just to survive that do not just live to eat physical food and go around and eating and and taking pleasure in the physical things and let that be the end of it but lord let us surpass the physical we don't ignore the physical let us surpass the physical let us surpass survival and let us live a life of calling in jesus name lord we ask that you would give each and every one of us in this place store the calling upon my life lift, lift up our voices and pray yes Holy Spirit, restore the calling in our lives, Jesus. Set our eyes on the things above. Lord, set our eyes on the things above, God. Let us live according to your calling upon our lives. Not according to the flesh. Not according to carnal desires. Not according to situations. Not just living a life of survival. But Lord, let us live a life that submits to your will. A life that lives for your kingdom cause a life that lives for your purpose and your goal Lord Jesus yes Holy Spirit we ask you restore calling in our lives Holy Spirit let our lives be a worship unto you Jesus let the entirety of our lives be like an incense a perfume an aroma of worship that goes up to you Jesus even in our times of rest let it be worship unto you. Let it fall under the covering of your calling, Jesus. Yes. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we ask you. Restore. Reveal the hope of your calling upon our lives, God. You are our calling, Jesus. Only you are our calling, Jesus. We live for your glory. We live for your praise. you have given us Lord Jesus yes yes Jesus we worship you Jesus we live to worship you Jesus we live to work and to serve and to worship you Jesus a life without this purpose a life without this work is meaningless restore worship in our lives God Restore work in our lives, Jesus. Restore purpose and vision in our lives, Jesus.
want us to go into spiritual warfare. There's a, there's a scripture in Proverbs that says, for a lack of a vision, my people perish. Beloved, if there's a lack of vision, a lack of purpose, and a lack of a calling in your life, we perish. We fall victim to the traps of the enemy. We fall victim to our sinful desires. Why? Because we have no satisfaction in the only source of satisfaction that is Jesus Christ. And we turn to other satisfactions. We turn to other things to give us pleasure and to give us peace and joy and hope and happiness. But none of them suffice. We call those addictions and chains and strongholds. Beloved, I don't know what addictions, I don't know what strongholds or chains you guys struggle, struggling with in your lives. But beloved, we're going to break off every addiction that comes from lack of purpose. So let's lift up our hands and our voices and say this, Holy Spirit, we ask you, restore purpose, restore a vision, a goal and a calling in our lives. And Lord, as you restore that, let us find only satisfaction, only in Jesus Christ, God. Let our hope and our joy and our peace and our satisfaction and pleasure come from only Jesus Christ and nothing else. Lord, if there's anything that we've clung on to, that we've, that we've uh, clutched on to, Lord Jesus, for our satisfaction, and if there's an addiction in our lives, Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus, with every addiction, every chain, every stronghold, be broken down in Jesus' name. As you restore calling in our lives, as you restore purpose in our lives, Lord, restore direction. Let every distracted direction of focus come back into alignment with your purpose and your calling in our lives. Beloved, let's lift our voices and engage in spiritual warfare and say, break every addiction, break every chain, loosen every bondage in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, let's lift our voices and pray. Yes. Holy Spirit, we break every addiction. Holy Spirit, we ask you in the name of Jesus, every distraction, every addiction and chain that comes from a lack of dependency, that comes from a lack of relationship, that comes from a lack of partnership in your calling upon our lives. Lord, would they be broken down in Jesus' name. find only satisfaction in your name Jesus in your purpose in your calling and in your work over our lives let our food be to do the work of God and to accomplish your work Jesus and as we do so would you break down every addiction break down every addiction Lord loosen every bondage
Let's pray for one last thing. Let's pray according to Job 23, 12. Job is, in all his struggles, in his difficulties and suffering, he makes this confession. He says this. He says, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Amen. Beloved, let's pray like this. Whatever situation we're facing, whatever situation we have in front of us, the reason that we burn out, the reason why we feel like we have no strength to go on, the reason why we don't want to go on and we feel tired spiritually and fatigued spiritually, it's hard to come out even on Sundays. It's hard to do anything really. It's because we are not eating of the proper spiritual food. It's not because we're not fed physically. It's not because we're not sleeping physically. It's not because we're not resting physically. It's because we are not intaking of the correct food. And it is the word that proceeds from his very mouth. Amen. Beloved, let's pray like this. Holy Spirit, renew in us. Everyone in this room today, Lord. Renew in us a new passion. A fiery passion, Lord, for your word, God. Lord, renew in us a passion for your word, Lord. Lord, this is our source of life, our fountain of life, the river of living water, your word. And Lord, connect us once again to this source in prayer and in worship to enter into relationship with you once again. Restore passion for your word, Lord Jesus, and breathe upon us a fresh breath, a fresh wind of life, a fresh wind of your spirit. Let us be renewed in your spirit, Lord Jesus. Awaken us, revive us as you renew our passion for your word, Lord Jesus, and lift up our voices. One last time, church, let's cry out to the Lord. Say, renew our passion for your word and blow a fresh breath of life here in TCCI. Let's lift up our voices and pray. Yes! Holy Spirit, breathe. Holy Spirit, breathe a fresh breath of life in this body, Lord Jesus. Renew a fire. Renew a passion, Lord Jesus. For your word. For your word, God. For your word, which is our very bread of life. Which is our source of life, God. Let us be filled with your word. Let us be filled with your spirit, Lord Jesus. Yes. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, revive us. Holy Spirit, awaken our spirits to love you with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, our minds, our wills, our strength, Lord. Yes. Pour it out, God. Pour it out, God. Spirit of prayer. Spirit of worship. A spirit of a zeal for your word. And feed us spiritually. Rejuvenate us and recharge us that we may run the race and fight the good fight in our lives, Lord. Refuel us with the fire of your word that we may live a life and a walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling that you have placed upon our lives, Lord Jesus. Seek 
first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you Lord we take this word and we say Lord may everything in our lives be geared towards that one thing which is you Jesus Christ Lord we ask that Jesus Christ would be the center of everything that we do in our lives Lord just as when David became king the first thing that was on his heart was to return the Ark of the Covenant. And he placed that Ark right in the center of Jerusalem. Jerusalem being the center of the world at the time. Lord, the Ark of the Covenant was in the center of the world. Jesus, you were at the center of the world. Lord, we say that even now, you are at the center of the world, Lord Jesus. You are at the center of our hearts, at the center of our lives, at the center of this world and at the center of the universe and the cosmos, Lord, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Lord Jesus. This is how we envision this world. Jesus at the center of everything. Lord, we ask that as we say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, that we would see a day that this kingdom where Jesus totally rules and reigns, Jesus is totally at the center of everything would be fully and perfectly established. We ask that that, would, that day would come swiftly, Lord Jesus, as we cry out, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. But until that day, but until that day, let your children, the church that is the salt and light, be a living manifestation of what it means to have Christ at the center of everything, Lord Jesus. May we be the salt and light that shows the world what it means to have Jesus at the center of everything that we do, Lord. Let us be the taste of the kingdom of God on this earth, Lord. Lord, we do not just live to eat, Lord, but we eat to work. Everything in the physical all for the glory of God, Lord Jesus. Everything that we do, our rest, our eating, our enjoyment, all for the kingdom of God, Lord Jesus. We ask today, pour out the spirit of one thing in this church today, right here, right now, Lord Jesus. And may we be worshipers who offer up our bodies as a living sacrifice unto you, Lord Jesus. The entirety of our lives that you would be glorified each and every second of our lives, Lord. Lord, we thank you. We ask that your will would be done through our lives and through this body, TCCI. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's lift up a shout of praise to the Lord. Let's give thanksgiving and proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus as King of kings and as Lord of lords. We say you are worthy of all honor, of all praise, of all glory. Lord, we thank you. We love you. Be the center of it all, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. We love you, Jesus. Amen.